Any questions? Any comments? It's been a while since uh, um, Anand, I'd like to introduce Anand. He's a uh, psychologist. Uh, he's in Brazil. And um, can you say a little bit about yourself, Anand? Yes, for sure. Um, I am a psychologist, as you said. Uh, I live in Brazil. Uh, actually, I never live in Brazil. I never uh, been outside of my my country. And I meet Alex on Facebook, uh, following his work, and I like very much. So we talk a little, and he uh, invited me to this group. I'm very glad to be with uh, all of you guys. Yeah, um, uh, Anand works uh, in addictions counseling. So, you know, people with, you know, problems with uh, various substances and uh, whatever. Um, so he, he, he deals with, you know, some deep emotional problems with people. Um, Karen, how are you doing? How is it down in Mexico? Looks nice it's, and bright. You know, it's a cold morning. It's been a cold winter and we're all getting over colds. Yeah. So that's about where we are. Snowing. You know what? I had a major cold and I, know, I never get colds, but I had a bad one this year. Um, Ian, how are you doing? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Busy. How, good. how are things in Portland? Um, wet. Wet. <laughs> As okay. always this time of year. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll just I'll just I'll just share this again, just to shock everyone. This is the Toronto weather right now, minus Ooh. fifteen with a wind chill of minus twenty five in Fahrenheit. Um, Fahrenheit is minus five with a wind chill of minus thirteen. Um, so uh, winter has certainly arrived in this country. Uh, and uh, where's my other? picture. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw it on. Uh, I took this picture about an hour and a half ago. Uh, my dog looking out the window. <laughs> we, we haven't had snow this year. This is our first real snow. So uh, um, so you think it's cold in Mexico, do you? <laughs> Karen? It was, uh, 38 Fahrenheit when we got up this morning. Which oh, okay. But it'll I guess be it... 70 today. Okay. So, okay. not too bad. So, how is everyone doing? How, um, any comments about the inner work, how it's going? Um, <laughs> struggles over the holidays or over the season? Uh, the, the, any questions? Anything you'd like to share with us? Ian? I have, um, when we spoke last week, you recommended that I focus on the the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, um, and I'm I'm realizing how difficult it is to actually be present to any of those fully. Um, there, like I can look and I can see something, and you know the lamp over there, but I don't know. There's this feeling of. Um, of something coming between the the input and myself, unless I'm really like settled and focused. Um, and the same with the other senses to a certain degree, there's kind of this initial moment of contact. And then uh, I almost feel like I'm looking at an after image or I'm listening to my idea of the sound. I don't know. It's, it's strange. It's, yeah. it's just strange how, how pleasant I have to be to actually maintain that contact for any anything beyond that initial blip. Um, so I'm st I'm not sure if I'm understanding it properly. Um, you're able to do it. So right now you can become aware of your ears, mindful of your ears, picking up this sound of my voice and the various other sounds or squeaks or whatever that are happening. But it lasts for just a short period of time and then it disappears it's hard to describe um it's hard, it's hard to put into words it's like in the, in the first moment i hear it as if it feels as if it's present like it and then 
I noticed that I start, you know, I'll start thinking about it. Or, uh, you know, so it kind of gets in the way of that. There, it's my, my thought process or even just the, the memory of what I, of the moment I was like, oh, I got it. And then <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, when you say the thought process, do you mean that you start to think again in words and you start to narrate the experience? <clears throat> no, definitely not words. More, it's just I, I, ideas, Im images, I don't know, forms, um, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I found that, you know, when I become consciously aware of what I can see and consciously aware of my eyes receiving all sorts of visual information and then consciously aware of what I can hear, you know, my ears receiving information, aware of the direction, the source of sounds, my nose becoming aware of, you know, the scent, uh, the smell in the air and the taste in my mouth, particularly when I overlap them, when I try to become aware of all of them at the same time. I can't have any other thoughts. Um, but this was the very, very, very first exercise I was ever taught. Um, so I'm going back to January 5th, 1981. Uh, when uh, Dr. Christopher Holmes in uh, a course, third year or second year course called Theories of Personality at York University here in Toronto, uh, narrated us through um, mm -hmm. self-remembering and he started with the head. Is that where so, so for me, I've always done it as a head brain activity. Not always, but for the, for years it would be, I would, I actually would start with my ears. It was easier for me to focus auditorily um, so the first thing I would become aware of was what I could hear. Then I'd be aware of what I could see while remaining aware of what I could hear. And then aware of what I can see here while remaining, uh, uh, become aware of what I can smell and taste and build up the perception. And I found that in the moment when I was consciously or mindfully looking, listening, smelling and tasting, that I couldn't be engaged in any other activity. It was like I could be thinking and you know, the, the thoughts and the images and whatever, or I could be perceiving the external world through uh, the four senses that are located in my head. Um, so you, you start and it begins to happen and then something comes up in between the perception Mm, that seems to be with that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not that the perception goes away entirely. Um, it just, it, it kind of goes, it feels like it goes on automatic. Okay. Rather than intentional. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing about mindfulness or, you know, the deliberate use of our intention is it can never be automatic. Um, you know, automatism and the automatic perceptions actually occur at much lower levels. So your eyes are always aware of all of this, the, the images coming in. Your ears are always aware of the sounds coming in. Your nose is aware of the scents in the room. Your mouth is aware of the taste in your mouth. But normally only at the subconscious level, and we're not really consciously aware of it. When we step up to that next level, that, that level of mindful awareness, that level of self-reflectivity, it has to and can only be an act of deliberate intent. So you're able to intend and make that step and then something slips you back down again? Seems to be, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you know, with your background in Buddhism and, you know, sort of a somatic body oriented approach to mindfulness. Um, I mean, this is why I recommended it to you when we were talking last week, because you've spent so much time developing that awareness of your breath, of your body, the sensation of self that, uh, you know, to, to properly self remember, it's actually fully self remembering as a three brained approach. So not only is it consciously looking, listening, smelling, tasting with our head brain, it's also consciously or mindfully developing the sensation of self. That's the awareness of our body as one organic whole. And at its at very advanced level, 
It's also to become aware of our feelings or to even, as Mr. Gurdjieff said in, uh, to Uspensky in Search of the Miraculous, to consciously breathe in a, a feeling or a tiny dollop of joy. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's building up this ability to be more and more and more and more and more conscious. Um, but this is why we must start with the body brain. We must start with self-sensing because we actually have to hold that in the back of our awareness so that we can consciously perceive. So looking, listening, smelling, tasting. Um, I realized it took me years to realize that uh, Dr. Christopher Holmes, who taught me how to self-remember in that <laughs> class uh, th over 38 years ago now, did it in slightly wrong order. Um, because he started with the head brain, and then we went into the body brain, and then into the the feeling brain. Um, but I, I'm so you 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 you're able to do it. So right now in this moment, you're able to focus on the screen in front. And you know, if I move my hands, you're able to sort of you know peripherally become aware of movement. And you know, out of the corner of your eyes, perhaps see the room. And then something interferes. Well, it, it's it's I can all of those things are still happening. You know, I can I can I can see you. We're talking. I can see my hand. You know, I can hear the sound of scratching my head here. Um, there's a depth to it that seems to fluctuate. So sometimes it feels very, very real, um, and other times it feels usually kind of right right at the start it's very real and then other times as it goes on it becomes more of a it becomes less real it becomes less i'm less present to receive it it seems like but i mean it feels just like something i need to grow over time yeah but. yeah i mean it's like a muscle you know we've got to exercise the muscle and develop the muscle um, I mean, this is why I recommended last week that you begin to work on this level, because we've got to try and do it all. I mean, the, the awakened state is not three brain mindfulness. Um, you know, if the awakened state is man number five, three brain mindfulness. So to be conscious of what we see, hear, smell, taste, to be conscious and aware of our body and to be conscious of a feeling of joy or some kind of feeling is a really, really at the highest level of man number four. It's the highest level of the mindful awareness. And the awakened state is just the next level up. And you're, you're right at the border. When you're able to do that um, with the three brains, you're right at that border uh, between uh, man number four, man number five, between world 24 and world 40 uh world 12 so um that's you know our goal is to work on this and develop these skills more and more and more and more and all i can recommend is practice and perhaps try and uh, collect some more observations uh you know in the next week so you can come back next week and we can talk about this and try and figure it out a little bit more um i should say these questions are great i get a lot of comments uh, from people who email me and whatever, and they say that they really do enjoy uh, this exchange that we begin with where I ask if you have any issues, anything going on, because it helps them understand and uh, begin to work on their own practices. So uh, any other comments, any other, you know, observations, things that, you know, it's been, I guess our last meeting was way back in December. Um, so it's been four weeks. It's been almost a month now. Um, last week, uh, Ian showed up. Um, I guess I, I advertised it too late and made, made everyone aware uh, too late. And then Guido came for the last half hour. So we didn't really have a meeting. So no one missed anything. Um, so any other comments? Any other questions? Um, I, have, I have one um, request. Uh, uh, regarding one of the practices that um, I've read about is the void uh, practice. Um, are you familiar with that practice? The regard, it's it's uh, sort of bringing uh, the consciousness, bringing our focus on the area between the eyes, uh, bringing our consciousness to uh, uh, our throat, the the space in our throat, something like that. Can can you have? Can we do something like this, or 
Um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the, the, you know, the void and all of that and bringing our consciousness to the part of that part of the brain and the throat is not a Gurdjieffian practice. Um, but the, the name, the void, uh, there are elements that, uh, you know, we can understand this in sort of a Gurdjieffian fashion. Um, one of the attributes of the awakened state of world number 12, the real I, the real I is the witness, the observer, it's consciousness itself. And it's that part of ourself that does not exist in the world. So my body is a thing. My thoughts are things. My feelings are things. But this part of myself, the witness, the observer, is no thing. It's an element. Of, it's the part of me that I can say is nothing. So to be aware of that nothing. Um, so... I know that in uh, Sufism, they talk about the Thana state, um, which is really like the extinction. It's like a state of extinction. Um, it's like a state of negation. It's like a void, um, to use that term. And uh, within the uh, Neo-Dvaitan, the Advaitan movement, which is a Hindu uh, movement, Dvaita means dual, Advaita means non-dual. And they talk about almost like an extinction of the self. And from a Gurdjieffian perspective, I understand this as stepping into the holy denying, which is the level above the awakened state. So the awakened state is really awakening the witness, the observer, you know, where our consciousness moves back almost behind ourselves, And we see our body as just another formation in the world. We, not just our body, but our thoughts, our head, brain, perceptions, thoughts, images, our body and our feelings as elements of the world and we're something different. Get out there, I think it wants in, a black one. Um, so, uh, whoops, I'm just, we got some background noise, so I'm just gonna try and mute a few of these microphones in the background. Um, so, the, uh, and a metaphor that I came up with many years ago is a bubble rises up from the bottom of a glass of water or a pool of water. We look at the bubble. We watch it rising up. What we realize is that we do not see the bubble. Rather, we see the water that has been displaced around the bubble. And what we are seeing is the water, the bubble, and what's in the bubble is invisible. And in some ways, you know, our thoughts, our head brain, the activities of our head brain, our body brain, our feeling brain is the displacement. It's what we look like, what we think of ourselves as. But, you know, our body is really a walking, moving, talking, breathing clump of earth come to life. Um, you know, we came from dust and we will return to dust. And there's something else, something more profound that's hidden uh, within us. Um, I know that in the uh, Willem Nylon groups, um, one of Mr. Gurdjieff's students, they talked about this aspect, this dimension of our being, almost as if it were a single cell, you know, an embryonic form that we have to grow. Uh, so... Behind us, within us, there's that level of nothing, no thing. There's that, that, that th you know, part of us is beyond the world. And what we have to do is we have to grow this part of our being, grow this awareness. And, you know, we can use a number of different words to describe that, that, that other part, the witness, the observer, consciousness, but we could also call it the void because it's, you know, it is like a void. And um, I know that one of the, uh, uh, a, a Hindu philosopher uh, by the name of Sri Aurobindo, um, I spent three years studying him at university. I couldn't find at university, uh, you know, when I moved to uh, Ottawa, any uh, professor who knew anything about Gurdjieff and Mr. Gurdjieff. So I started studying Hinduism. 
And Sri Aurobindo is actually a fourth way philosopher. His teachings mirror uh, uh, Mr. Gurdjieff. It's incredible how similar the teachings are. Um, uh, Sri Aurobindo, he spent from the age of 7 to 21 in England, um, being educated in England. He got a, a first-class degree from uh, Cambridge University. He went back to India when he was about 21 and had various mystical experiences. And then he began looking around, and he noticed that there's Jnana Yoga, which is the head-brain yoga. And then he noticed there was like Hatha Yoga, which is a body-brain yoga. And then there was Bhakti Yoga, which was the emotional brain yoga. And uh, he wrote a book called The Synthesis of Yoga, where he put them all together and said we should follow all of them inwards at the same time. In other words, develop the harmonious, balanced being. Um, he called it matter, life, and mind. Matter is the, or mind is the head brain, matter is the body brain, and life is the emotional center, the feeling brain. He also said that behind the mind, is a small kind of witness station. So there's an element of consciousness behind our head brain. Um, we can use the term void, uh, no thing. Um, he also said that there is almost like a witness station behind the body brain. So that, you know, when we become aware of our body, we can also become aware of that uh, consciousness, that awareness uh, behind the body as well as there's a witness station, uh, a part of ourselves that is behind our feeling brain. Now, in Hinduism, he used the term Purusha, which really means consciousness. And then he said behind those three, there was the what he called the psychic entity, which in uh, um, Mr. Gurdjieff's terms would have been the real I. But when we talk about the Purusha, the psychic entity, the real I, these are the parts of the, the this is the, 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 the air inside the bubble displaced by the water. All we see is the displacement. We don't see the air. And so there are many different terms that we can use to describe that level of our being. Um, as I said, you know, Purusha, consciousness, witness, observer. Um, it's a void because we can't describe it. It's beyond this world. Um, so behind our body, when we become aware of our body, there is this element of consciousness, which we can, you know, call it the void. We can call it no thing. Uh, we can call it pure awareness uh, that exists behind our body. So I guess anywhere, you know, behind our, our prefrontal cortex, there will be uh, uh, something that can witness that. There will be something that can witness our throat. Um, so these are just terminologies. They're just different words. Um, does anyone else have any, I don't know if that answered your question at all. Um, anyone else have any questions, comments? Um, most of you are muted, so you just have to, you know, click on your microphone or if you have any questions or comments. Okay, well, let's recognize that we have a body brain, a physical self, and that our body, and that our body brain and actually, even our, our head brain, there's an element of our head brain, the organic part of our head brain that exists in our skull, our body brain, and even our heart, and the ganglion, and all the various things that make up our feeling state, that we, we have a head brain, body brain, and feeling brain that exists in world 48, that exists in this normal world. And we also have a part of ourself that exists in world 24 which uh, Mr. Gurdjieff, uh, when he talked to Uspensky, referred to as essence. And then we have a part of ourself that exists at a higher level, that witness, that consciousness, which uh, Willem Nyland said is like a single tiny cell or almost embryonic, and that we have to grow. But when we work on ourselves, when we do inner work, we are working on the physical realm, we're working in world 48. So whatever we do in terms of our inward uh, work has an effect on the world, it has an effect on our environment through our body. And then the essential level 
world 24 is what we share with humanity with other people you know it's like a jar of water and a drop is taken out and we are that drop and our essence is that drop and then at death that drop returns to the ocean of being um, at the level of essence and then we have something that is ours at the higher level that embryonic part that we can grow into the real eye and so whenever we do inner work we're working along these three levels we are working for this planet we are working for humanity our fellow human being and we are working for ourselves so it's always good to recognize that whenever we do any kind of inner work we are working along these three separate and yet interrelated lines so i would like you to just become aware of your body take a moment to become aware of your breathing the sensation of air as it flows in through your nose nasal cavity back of mouth throat vocal cord and back out again become aware of the movement of the various muscles involved in breathing your diaphragm abdomen the muscles between your ribs Try to become aware of your body, breathing, sensing your body, aware of your body. And let's do Mr. Gurdjieff's filling exercise. So as the vessel fills with warm, golden honey, imagine your body filling with sensation. So starting with the bottom of the feet, just become aware of the soles of your feet perhaps where they're touching the ground or the shoes you may be wearing or your socks. Become aware of the bottom of your feet. And then imagine your feet filling with sensation as a vessel fills with warm golden honey. So sensing from the bottom of your feet to the top of your feet. Sensing your feet from your toes to your heels. And then from the bottom of your feet, move up and sense your feet up to your ankles. And then slowly move up through your lower legs, up to your knees. So sensing from the bottom of your feet up to your knees, and then moving up your knees, up your lower uh, upper legs, up to your hips. And become aware of your hands as well. So sensing your body from the bottom of your feet all the way up to your hips and hands. And then from your bottom of your feet up to your midriff, uh, lower arms, lower back, or your lower, lower abdomen, lower arms, lower back. And then sensing from the bottom of your feet up to your midriff, elbows, middle back. And then sensing from the bottom of your feet all the way up to your chest, upper arms, upper back. And then from the bottom of your feet all the way up to your shoulders. And then up through your neck and then up to the top of your head, sensing your body from the bottom of your feet all the way up to the top of your head. And then try to hold this perception, this awareness, the sensation of self, the awareness of your body as one organic whole, aware of your body, perhaps aware of gravity, aware of balance, how your head is balanced on your neck, which is balanced on your shoulders, which is balanced on your spine, aware of the sensation of self. And then try to hold this in the background of your awareness. Try to keep a part of your conscious awareness on your body. And then do your best to become mindful of what you can see but not in a specifically focused way not with your attention pulled to a specific spot try to become aware of the global vision and here um it's also important to recognize that when we do start to develop this mindful uh awareness of what we can see that pay attention to the peripheral of your vision. Uh, it's good to engage in mindful awareness of what we can see in environments where there's things and movements just in the corner of our vision.
So perhaps sitting on a park bench where there's lots of people walking by, and we may just focus on a single point, but we want to maintain a global awareness so that we are aware of what is happening at the peripheral of our vision. And it's very important, the periphery is very important because normally like the foveal point, if you put your hand out, an arm out and stick your thumb up, your thumbnail, when it's out that distance, is actually the point where your eyes are able to focus. And the further and further we get away from that, the more we move into the peripheral vision. And we're normally not aware of the peripheral vision. So when becoming conscious of what we can see, while hopefully remaining aware in the background of the sensation of yourself, that awareness of your body while becoming aware of what you can see, the global view from your eyes, the peripheral, aware of different you know, qualities of light, different colors, different shades coming in. And then try to become aware of your hearing and to recognize that we can also talk and become aware of peripheral, peripheral aspects of our hearing. That, you know, I'm right beside a main road here. I can hear buses going by and I can hear cars, but I can also become aware of the peripheral of my hearing, those elements of my hearing that are usually very automatic that I'm not usually aware of. Um, very similar to the peripheral of my vision, to become aware of the peripheral of my hearing and to do your best to try and engage in a global impartial awareness of the sounds that are coming in through your ears. Again, we can also observe the same phenomenon within our nose. We can focus on dominant smells, but if we really begin to pay attention to the, 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 our olfactory sense, the sense of smell, we can begin to notice that there are peripheral smells. There's a periphery to our sense of smell as well. And the same with our sense of taste. Even though you may not be eating food, your mouth has a taste right now. There is always a taste in our mouth. And we can become aware of the dominant taste, and we can also expand it to develop a global and impartial awareness of the peripheral dimensions of our taste. So this is the head-brain dimension of self-remembering. Done along with the body brain is basic self-remembering. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff defined basic self-remembering as any form of two-brained mindful awareness. He didn't use the word mindful, one of which has to include the body. So by becoming aware of what I can see, that global impartial vision, the peripheral, and being aware of my body, just visual and the body is a form of self-remembering. Becoming aware of what I can see, hear, smell, taste while sensing my body is a much more advanced form of self-remembering. And if we bring a degree of feeling and awareness of feeling into it, we begin to engage in three-brained self-remembering. But this is a very advanced form of self-remembering. Mr. Gurdjieff didn't talk about it a lot uh, to his students because he, uh, we, we've got to develop the first two. We've got to develop the body brain and then we've got to develop the head brain and then we've got to develop the head brain and the body brain together. Then we have to develop the feeling brain and then we have to develop the head brain, body brain and feeling brain together. So it's a real slow, long process. But right now, just try to become aware of what you can see, that global, impartial awareness coming in through your eyes, including the peripheral. And then try to maintain that awareness of what you can see while also becoming aware of what you can hear, the sound of my voice, um, any background sounds where you are. And so while remaining aware of what you can see and what you can hear, also become aware of what you can smell. And while remaining aware of what you can see, hear, smell, 
become aware of what you can taste while doing your best to maintain that awareness of your physical body. Aware of what you can see, hear, smell, taste, and the organic sensation of your body as one whole, as an indivisible organic perception. Aware of what you can perceive through your head brain, looking, listening, smelling, tasting, while sensing your body brain. And try to do this this week. Try to engage in this activity. Um, if it's too much, just focus on the head. Try to become aware of, you know, the vision, the impartial gaze, the peripheral hearing, smelling, tasting. And uh, we can begin next week with questions about this, seeing if you've had any problems, any observations, any obstacles, and uh, come back to that. And now, let's just finish. Let's just imagine, become aware of the fact that we are surrounded by an atmosphere. And this atmosphere can be dispersed. It can actually be pulled all the way to the other side of the world if we were thinking about something going on there. Uh, it, it, it can be pulled away through process of identification, through thinking about other people, through whatever. But we can also collect it. We can bring it close to ourselves. So collect your atmosphere. I mean, this is called the collected state uh, exercise. Keep your atmosphere around you. Become aware of it, perhaps a meter, meter and a half, like four to six, seven feet, like a bubble that surrounds you. Try to become aware of the border of your atmosphere. Sense it. You know, keep it calm, keep it tranquil, keep it still. And in a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, just breathe it in. Breathing in the results of this uh, small bit of inner work we've done this morning. One, two, three. Just breathe it in. And then as you breathe out, imagine something remains, some part of the, the little work that we've done. And then let's just finish by silently repeating in our mind, may results of this exercise be transformed within me for my being. And, you know, I find it interesting that Mr. Gurdjieff did use affirmations such as the one that I just used, um, ways of uh, uh, locking this inner work into ourselves. Um, one of the things that I want to start talking about now, and I, I should mention a couple of things. Um, you know, back in the fall, I had mentioned how I was uh, going to, with my, my live group, do some hypnosis recordings. I tried that, and I wasn't satisfied with the recordings, which is why I never posted any of them online. So if any of you were expecting that, it was an experiment that I tried, and I just didn't feel satisfied. I would have to write and spend a lot of time working on scripts and uh, whatever to develop that. Um, so that's why that, that never happened. And the other thing is for, you know, for the next few meetings, uh, what I really want to talk about is esoteric psychology. And there are a number of very uh, important things that we need to understand. Um, esoteric really means inner uh, or the inner circle. So inner, inner circle psychology, um, mystical psychology, uh, Gurdjieffian psychology. We can you know, use many different names to describe this process. But Mr. Gurdjieff said that we cannot study psychology without studying cosmology so in order to understand ourselves we also have to begin to understand the universe now there's a very very famous phrase that most people know and they attribute to the greeks but it's not greek in origin it's egyptian and possibly far older than egypt and it's the phrase know thyself and most people are aware of this phrase, know thyself. And they don't realize that it's part of a formula. And this is only one part of it. The actual full phrase is know thyself 
and thou shalt know the gods in the universe. And as I said, this is a formula because we can invert it. Know the gods in the universe and thou shalt know thyself. So the exploration and the study of the self, of who we are, also has to go along with the study of the universe. Um, there's a famous Hindu phrase that what is here is everywhere, and what is not here is nowhere. Um, there's another esoteric phrase um, attributed to uh, um, Hermes Trigemus, Trigenesis, trigemesis um, which is as above, so below. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff said that last one, as above, so below, isn't entirely accurate. He said that in order to really understand ourselves, we have to study the world above ourselves and the world below ourselves. So to properly understand who we are, we need this threefold awareness um to me the most important diagram um let me see i thought i had it on my screen yeah here it is this is the, the most important diagram that mr gurdjieff provided us as far as i'm concerned is the diagram of all living things which comes towards the end of in search of the miraculous and I remember, you know, when I first read it, he said, this fits in with all of the earlier stuff he talked about, even though it doesn't quite seem to fit in some of the terms and some of the ways of understanding things. And uh, the, the, the more I've studied this, the more I realize how it fits in with everything. And uh, this ancient diagram that goes way back gives us tremendous insight into both psychology and cosmology. And I'm just going to pull it up. And I've got two slightly different versions of it. Um, let me just try and, whoops. Can you all see this? Or OK, so the ancient diagram of all living things in the middle i've stuck the ray of creation um so this ancient diagram of all living things within our own particular ray of creation shows us how we fit into the world now in the left the diagram as it was given to uspensky by mr gurdjieff listed man in world 24. But this is not entirely accurate. Humanity, humanity today exists in world 48 on the level of the vertebrates. So if you see over in the right, I've got <laughs> slumbering man and the vertebrates. The next level up, mindful man. And the further level up, awake man. But if we look at awake man on the one side and we look over on the other side, the, year, the word that Mr. Gurdjieff used was angels. So in a sense, you know, an awakened man can be said to have the center of gravity of their psychic life, of their inner life on the level of the angels. So when we begin to grow the real eye, when we begin to take it from its embryonic form, and grow it into uh, a, a, a much more comprehensive part of ourselves. It's like we exist on the level of the angels. And, uh, you know, within esoteric thought and, uh, you know, within certain myths, the angels, you know, it's been said that an awakened man is greater than an angel because he has that human dimension, that dimension of evolution and the, you know, the, the need to evolve and having evolved as well as that existence on that level. So he becomes more or greater than the angels. Um, so another important thing to understand, for instance, um, in the New Testament, 
St. Paul uses three terms, soma, psyche, and pneuma. And psychology, the study, you know, psyche, the, the, comes from the Greek term. And this is where if we focus, you know, too much on words or too little on words, we can run into certain mistakes. Because the study of psychology or psyche, that is ourselves in world 24. Um, let me see if I can. So this here, whoops, is the study of psychology. You know, Mr. Gurdjieff was asked about the study of psychology, and he said, you're not ready to study psychology. First, you have to study mechanics. By that, he meant we have to study ourselves at the level of world 48. In uh, St. Paul, Soma, Psyche, Numa, world 48 is Soma, world 24 is Psyche, and then world 12 is Numa, which is spirit. So body, soul, and spirit. Uh, these are the three most important levels of our being. However, we are three-story beings. So wherever the center of gravity uh, of our self is, you know, we exist at that level, the center of gravity of our psychic life or our inner life. We also have access to the realm above and the realm below. So it's also important to study the world above and the world below. For a normal man, they're centered in world 48. World 24 is the mindful realm. It's the realm of self-reflection, of personal consciousness. World 48 is the slumbering state where, you know, we're ruled more by our formatory apparatus. And we exist in a level of, you know, waking sleep. But for a normal man existing centered in world 48, they also have to study world 96. World 96 is, I call it the lose it emotions. So homicidal rage, um, peeing your pants, terror. Uh, the uh, self-negating despondency. It's where we are the emotions where we don't exist, where we are the anger, we're just road rage or homicidal rage or whatever. And this leads to, you know, um, people making fun of the Gurdjieff teachings. Um, there's a, you know, U.S. writer by the name of Sam Harris and I'm not too enamored by him. Um, one of his videos, someone sent me a link to one of his videos where he talks about Gurdjieff. And he obviously went onto the website or went onto the web, typed Mr. Gurdjieff in and looked for the most ridiculous thing and said, Mr. Gurdjieff said that we feed the moon and that's why we're here. But if you understand that the level 96 in the center, this is the level of the moon. There's a part of our being that's the invertebrate self. That when we engage in homicidal rage or road rage, where we get so terrified that we are pure terror. In those moments, we actually exist at the level of world 96. We exist at the level of the moon. And we can look at this and we can understand that, you know, not only are we really three-story beings, but, you know, at the basic element of life within us, you know, we have a metallic self. You know, we've got iron in our bloodstream, you know, we've got various metals within us. And then built on the metallic self is the mineral self. Built on that is the vegetative self. Built on that is the invertebrate self. Built on that is the vertebrate spinal column self. And so rather than looking at us as three-story beings, it's like we are apartment buildings. 
and maybe even like pyramids because the base is denser, darker, thicker than the elements above. Um, this is something, you know, if you've ever seen documentaries on medieval architecture, they talk about how they put the real heavy rocks at the lowest level and the lighter rocks at a, you know, the next level and lighter rocks and lighter. And in a sense, this is how we are created. Um, we are, you know, we exist on all of these levels. And these are all levels that we can observe outside. So Mr. Gurdjieff said, sometimes it's easier to study cosmology, it's easier to study the universe outside ourselves, and at other times it's easier to study ourselves. And, you know, to see the correspondence from within ourselves to the world around us. So, you know, it's, we can look at vertebrates. We can look at invertebrates. You know, what is an invertebrate? An invertebrate is any animal that doesn't have a spinal column. It doesn't have a central nervous system. So there's something about the movement up to the central nervous system running through a spinal column to the brain stem into the brain that distinguishes our um, vertebral self from our invertebral self but they all exist within us. Um, we, these ancient structures, you know, they're, they're not made obsolete. They are part of us. It's like we're this growth, higher and higher and higher. And so if we begin to look at invertebrates, or if we begin to look at the lower levels of vertebrates, perhaps the reptilians, uh, you know, the, the, the simplest creatures with spinal columns and the most advanced creatures that do not possess spinal columns and begin to look at them and then ask, what characteristics do I share with those levels? What is myself in World 96? Uh, world 96 is a very dark, very heavy within us and the way we experience it, a very dark, heavy emotional realm. So if you've ever gotten so angry that you became anger and you engaged in road rage or hit someone or something like that, in that moment, the center of gravity of your inner self was in world 96. This is very difficult to observe within ourselves because it's such a heavy, such a mechanical state of awareness. But we can observe it within other people. Lots of clips on YouTube of people having road rage and smashing in windows and getting in fights and, uh, um, this is actually a level that a lot of people experience when they engage in warfare. So in Mr. Gurdjieff's book, Beelzebub Tales from His Grandson, um, he devotes a lot of attention to warfare. And, you know, what it, you know, what purpose does it serve? Why does it happen? And he said that there's an element of feeding that happens through warfare. Uh, we're feeding the moon. Um, now we have to understand when Mr. Gurdjieff said that we are feeding the moon, this is both a metaphor and it's not a metaphor. Um, the moon exists, level 96. You know, in the ray of creation, it's a dense world. Um, there's a part of ourselves that exists at that level. And when we give that uh, part more power, in a sense, we're feeding the world. So every time we engage in acts of homicidal rage or, you know, just that complete lose it rage or any time we are just absolutely terrified, so terrified we want to pee our pants, just we become that fear. And there's also a level of despondency that's 
similar. It's just a completely self-abnegation, uh, despondency. In those moments, we are centered at that level. In those moments, we are centered in World 96 and we are feeding the moon. Now, we also have to understand that, you know, within the blood and the body, within myself, there's gold, there's potassium, there's all sorts of metals within me. There's also uh, minerals, the next level up. So, you know, I have a mineral self. I also have a vegetative self. Uh, A.G. Bennett said our vegetative self was more centered in our um, intestines. The food we eat comes in, you know, the first place it's transformed is in our mouth, then it moves into our stomach and is transformed in our stomach, and then it moves into our duodenum. And the octave of food then meets with the octave of air. That allows the food and the digestive process to move up to our liver, to our cerebral hemispheres, to our cerebellum, and then down to our testes. Um, these are each different levels. So the food we eat comes in at level 768, which is on the level of metals. Uh, then it moves up to level 384, which is on the level of minerals. Then it moves up to level 192, where it meets with air. And then it moves up you know, through our, our cerebral hemispheres, our cerebellum. Uh, so our cerebral hemispheres are world 48. Our cerebellum is world 24. And then our testes and uh, ovaries are world 12. And so we can, you know, chart the course of the food diagrams by looking, uh, you know, at these numbers and understanding what these numbers mean. But I have a metallic self. I have a mineral self. I have a vegetative self. And J.G. Bennett said it was very important to learn to become conscious of our intestines, our large and small intestines. He said that this is the seat, the center of our vegetative self. There's a part of our self that exists on the same level as the plants. We are not above the plants looking down on the plants. We have higher levels within us than the plants, but we have a solid core of our self at that level. The same as our invertebrate self. We have an invertebrate self. There's a part of our self that exists at the same level as lobsters and uh, shrimp and insects and, you know, all of that. That, that this, It's a real part of ourselves. It hasn't disappeared. We're not these higher beings. We contain all of these lower elements within ourselves. And we are vertebral self, you know, this is where humanity really begins to evolve. We are sort of at the higher level of world 48. Immediately underneath us are the mammals. Uh, underneath them are the birds, and then underneath them are the reptiles. And, you know, this is the, the, the level of the chordate self, the, uh, you know, vertebral self. And this from the vertebrate and vertebral self down to the metallic self is what we leave behind. It's what gets buried in our grave, placed in our coffin, um, this physical dimension. So Mr. Gurdjieff talked about at death, a certain element within us gets released to feed the moon. A metaphor for there's a certain element within us that at the moment of death and when we die, that is of level 96. It's at the, the invertebral level. And that that has some kind of a function in terms of the ray of creation and the connection with the organic life on this planet. Now, something else, let me see if I can pull this diagram up. Um, just give me a second. Um, I'll stop sharing this one. Sorry. Um, 
stop sharing. Okay, um, just give me a second. There's a, a diagram that uh, um, came from Willem Nylon, who I mentioned earlier. Um, I don't know if I can find it that quickly. I messed everything up in my files a little while ago. Uh, here it is. Okay, give me a sec. Um, this comes from, uh, let me just shrink it slightly. The diagram I'm about to show you uh, comes from the Willem Nyland group. Um, and for us as human beings, this represents world 48, world 24, and world 12 in terms of our development. Um, hydrogen 48, hydrogen 24, and hydrogen 12. Let me get back to the draw. So we can see hydrogen 48 here, 24 here, and 12 here. Um, a metaphor that I came up with a number of years ago is it is like we are born fully developed physically, even though it will take approximately 24 years after birth for our body to be fully developed. In other words, for the full parts of our brain and everything to come to maturity. That's in a sense preordained. So it's like we are born with a fully functional, we are born with a fully functional physical body. Our physical body from birth is fully complete. Our emotional body, our self in world 24. So here the physical body, you know, this is this, this, whoops, you know, right, you know, I guess that's not really um, doing it properly, but from dough to dough over on the side here, the physical body is formed fully complete. But our question body, our emotional body, our self and world 24 is born incomplete. You know, the metaphor I use for this is it's like it's a 28 week old fetus. It's not viable. A 28 week old fetus, you know, without modern technology, if it comes into the world, it will die. Uh, it needs to remain within the womb and to develop further. So this part of our being needs to remain within our physical body in order to develop further. And this is where we begin to grow our being. So sort of the uh, purple triangle below, this is humanity as we are born. And then this triangle above the orangish triangle is what we must grow. So we are only half formed like a 28 week old fetus when uh, you know normally a normal human being and before we begin to work on ourselves that part of ourself is like I said a 28 week old fetus the real I the part of ourself that exists in world 24 consciousness that awareness exists like an embryo so we are born with a physical body our emotional body is like a 28 week old fetus and our real eye the part that we really have to develop is like a, an embryo you know a zygote you know just a fertilized you know egg inside the mother's womb and it, it has no ability to live on its own it requires the womb it requires to be embedded so on one self we have the physical body the self in world 48 and then we have the emotional body the astral body the question body which is half developed not sufficiently developed enough to survive on its own and then we have the real eye the higher being body that is only in embryonic form. Um, let me go back to the uh, other diagram. Um, 
So in this diagram, you know, the, the vertebral self was that physical self, the, the, the world 48, the world 24, the Kesjian body, the, our essence. This is where we're like the 28 we call fetus. And then the self in world 12 is our self in embryonic form. So we've got to begin by growing our self in world 24. And then we've also ultimately got to begin growing ourself in world 12. And I, was, I would hazard a guess to say that, you know, in terms of Hamid's question, that world 12 and 12 is the void phenomenon. So to become aware of that aspect, that's a void, is at that level. Um, this also shows that a lot of people who say that we're perfect, complete as we are, and it's just a matter of awakening to our higher nature. And this is uh, something that's prevalent amongst the uh, neo advaitans the, uh, um, the, the non-dualists like Eckhart Tolle and uh, a lot of people. Um, they say we just have to awaken to it. From the Gurdjieffian perspective, that part of ourself exists, but only in embryonic form. Um, Willem Nyland said it exists, but it exists like a single cell, and it must be grown into a bigger being. Um, so we, we, we have to develop that dimension of ourself. So we're born centered in world 48. So at the lowest level, world 96, and at the higher level, world 24. Let me bring up another diagram. Um, just give me one second. Whoops, it's the wrong one. Uh, and this one I've shown before, it's... Uh, um, uh, let me just get the... Um, so all, all of these diagrams, they're all different ways of representing the same truth. So um, this one I've talked about before. The square on the left. This is normal man with the physical body fully developed, the Kesjian or astral body in the uh, form of a 28 week old fetus and the uh, real eye, uh, the witness, the observer, just in embryonic form. The next level up, you know, here I called it mindful man, but it's the level of personal consciousness. The next level up is objective consciousness. So the state of waking sleep is the physical self, the physical body. It's at that, it's our self at level world 48. Um, where we're the 28 week old fetus, where we really have to begin to grow and develop is in the realm of personal consciousness. And then we've also, when we begin to do that, we begin to ultimately, we need to work on the level of objective consciousness at the, the level of the real I. So in terms of, you know, esoteric psychology, understanding where we fit into all of these things, understanding how this applies to us is a very, very important part of the process. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff said that mechanical man is little more than a machine, little more than an automaton. You know, we're filled with all of these habits. Um, let me just, uh, we see this and we go, oh, it's a cup. You know, it's on a table and we reach and pick it up. This is actually an automatic habit to know, to hold this, to bring it to our mouth. It's something that I learned through my moving center. Um, you know, walking upstairs, opening doors. Uh, so it, it's not quite like a machine. Uh, uh, J.G. Bennett preferred to use the word automatism. It's where we learn to exist habitually in the world. So we learn things on an habitual level. 
So doors, uh, door handles, um, you know, um, cups, the <laughs> handles of cups, various different things. We've got to begin to see the part of ourselves that exists at that level. Um, one of the things I've recently started doing is the lock screen, the movement of my hand for the lock screen, I've begun changing it. Um, so I get used to one lock screen and then I change it to something else. When I get used to that, I change it to something else. When I get used to that, I change it to something else. Just, you know, on my phone to open my phone. It's just a, uh, just a simple way because I, I, I go into my phone a number of times a day. It's just an exercise that lifts me up from that habitual mechanical realm where I'm ruled by automatisms, by programs, up to the level of mindful awareness. Uh, something else that I've done in the past is I move things from different pockets. You know, my standard place is to put my wallet in my back right pocket. And so I'll do that for a while and then I'll move it to my back left pocket. I like to keep my keys in my front right pocket. I'll move them to my front left pocket so that it requires me to, to think. It requires me to step out of that level of mechanical self, to step out of level uh, 48. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff defined level 48. He said that there are a number of characteristics of existing centered in this level. And one of them is a lack of unity, where we do one thing one minute and another thing the next minute, and we fail to see our contradictions. Uh, we lack unity. We lack the ability to do. Um, for most people, things just happen. You may think that, you know, someone say with a PhD or whatever, blah, wow, they really had a certain degree of will and ability to do. Most likely it was actually a result of mechanical forces and things pushing them in a certain way and, you know, a certain level of perseverance and uh, um, they ended up there. Uh, without any real central core to their personality without that that real ability to do without that real level of unity um one of the the metaphors that uh i i know it came from uh you know it was one of the things that was taught by the gurdjieff foundation is that you know we have different eyes multiplicity of eyes which is the concept found in in search of the miraculous that you know i've got one eye that reads an article about exercising and how exercising helps to stave off dementia, how exercising, you know, is a very cl cleansing tonic effect for the body, how it allows us to think more clearly and um, allows us to live longer. And I read the article with my head brain. Actually, I don't. They say you read the article with one eye. And so you decide I'm going to go jogging tomorrow morning and you set your alarm. And another eye wakes up and it's like, ah, and it's a different eye and it turns the alarm off. And uh, uh, we can experience this state of disunity, how we are this, you know, a conflicting mass of different impulses, different eyes. Um, I've explored that metaphor and what I think it is, is that there's an eye that exists in the head brain that's reading the magazine article and thinks of all of these positive benefits that science has demonstrated that comes from exercise. And then we have another eye that exists in the body brain and the eye that exists in the head brain sets the alarm and the body brain eye wakes up and it doesn't want to do that. It just, it's too tired, too focused on that, on the need for sleep and uh, whatever. So to study ourselves, to begin to study the contradictions within ourselves. Um, and when you begin to study the contradictions, you begin to realize that we're not quite as contradictory as we appear on the surface, because a lot of it is polarities. So there's a part that wants to exercise, there's a part that doesn't want to exercise. And there is a connection between them. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said that all likes are exquisitely balanced by dislikes. 
basically our dislike is one end of the continuum and our likes are the other end. And, you know, we balance between likes and dislikes. And if we begin to explore ourselves, we begin to connect dots within ourselves. So to study ourselves at the level of the machine, at World 48, the mechanical man. And here, you know, there's a, um, a animal psychology or evolutionary psychology where there are psychologists that go out and they study animals in order to get a better idea of who we are. Um, this is, in a sense, studying cosmology in order to understand ourselves. So if we study chimpanzees, we share 97% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Um, they don't have the prefrontal cortex that makes us human, but they have the mammalian brain and they've got the arms and the hands and, and whatever. If we begin to observe them, if we study them, if we read about uh, scientists who've studied them, we can gain a greater insight into our mechanical self, into that level of mechanical awareness. Um, then we begin to say, well, what's the difference between the mechanical self and the mindful self? What is the difference between ourselves in world 48 and ourselves in world 12? And to try and differentiate between them. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff used the term personal consciousness to define our level of awareness in world 24. Um, today, we're probably better acquainted and more familiar with the term mindfulness. And if any of you read the post that I just put on Facebook, uh, I think I did it yesterday or the day before, uh, about detachment. Um, there's a quality of hydrogen 24 that's a quality of detachment. Um, to be mindful of my hand to sense my hand, to sense the bones, tendons, ligaments, muscles in my hands, to be aware of my hand, to be personally conscious of my hand, requires me to inwardly detach from my hand to observe my hand. And in that post I quoted uh, Buddha, the Buddha said, life is suffering, suffering grows from desire, desire is caused by attachment and therefore the way to break free from suffering is to practice detachment and this level of mindful awareness of moving up to world 24 of taking that 28 week old fetus and growing it so it becomes a viable being we can use the term mindful but we can also use the term detachment it's a state where we begin to detach from the surface of our being. So when we're in the mechanical state, we're in a state of identification. We're in a state of attachment. We are really embedded in the world, but when we move up to the next level, we can characterize that level as a step towards detachment. And so if we understand that detachment, non-identification or disidentification or the separation of the self from the self or different ways, different characteristics for explaining that level, we can begin to get a clearer picture of how we do that. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said that as we go to bed at night, we should have a movie theater, the, the motion picture review, and we should visually see ourselves in the second person going throughout our day. Now, I've come across two versions of this, uh, Orage and you know, some others say become aware, go back to the first moment when we wake, woke up and begin to pictorially move through our day, seeing ourselves in the, the, the pictures we create. In other words, detaching, 
creating a second person awareness of ourselves to see our body as if we were existing outside. And then I've also come across other ones where they've said, Mr. Gurdjieff told them to do it backwards. So from the moment you lay down at the pillow to when you brushed your teeth to when you washed your face to when you put your pajamas on, but pictorially unwinding as if you were in the second person, which is another element of detachment. So detachment, disidentification, non-identification are all characteristics of this next movement. And then to move up to the state of objective consciousness of the real I is to bring that part or is to grow that part of ourself that doesn't exist in this world. Um, the real I, that the, the air inside the bubble. Everything else is really the, the displacement of the water around that invisible part. But, you know, so there's this growth. Now, we can also look at the earth because the earth is world 48. The planetary realm is world 24. The solar realm is world 12. So when Mr. Gurdjieff has said the, the sun, the planets, the earth, the moon, all exist within ourselves, what he meant was that we all have levels of our existence within ourselves that are part of ourselves that exist at these different levels. So what is the sun? What is the sun represented how is it represented? How is it manifest within me? This is the level of the real I, hydrogen 12. The planetary realm, this is the realm of essence. It's that realm of detachment. It's that realm of stepping inwards. The earthly realm is the earthly body, the physical body. The lunar realm is the in or the invertebral realm, the realm that we share, the element of our being that exists on the level of vertebrates, or not vertebrates, invertebrates, like lobsters and whatever. So when we begin to study ourselves, we can begin to see that there is this progression upwards. Um, I'm gonna stop here today, I'll continue this uh, uh, next week. Um, I mean, we've got five minutes before the end. Any quick questions? Something you'd like uh, to explain a little more? And, you know, think about questions for next week as well. And, uh, you know, we can start with our observations and what we can perceive and that, that global awareness of our vision. And we can start with some questions on uh, uh, what I've talked about today. Any questions? No comments? Uh, can, can we get the recordings of this session before um, before next week's session? Because it has lots and lots of... Uh, okay, yeah. Of I'll, I'll try and do that. Um, I'll, I'll yeah. try and do it this afternoon if I can. If I've got time, we'll see. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, go into this a little bit deeper, you know, over a few sessions. Um, I mean, this is so important, understanding ourselves, understanding where we fit into the universe. Um, Alan. Karen. Karen. Yeah. I just want to say thank you, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about the esoteric psychology. That's one of my major yeah. interests in this work. So thank you for looking yeah. to that. Yeah. Well, I'm a hypnotherapist, so, you know, I. it's like I, the Gurdjieff teachings are my lens that I look through when I am with any client. When I'm trying to find out what's going on with them, you know, I, I understand, you know, I think, oh, that's night world 96 years stuck in the moon there, or that's, you know, that's your habitual self. I don't use these words to them, but it informs everything that I do. Um, so I, you know, it's very important in terms of understanding who we are, understanding other people. Um, any other questions, comments? So, and on addictions, they're very low. 
Um, you know, they're war, you know, they're very mechanical. Um, a, another way we can, you know, the the multiplicity of eyes. Um, people who are addicted, even you know, cigarette smokers, they are aware that they have one eye that wants to smoke and another eye that doesn't want to smoke, and they are more aware than a lot of people of how contradictory they are. And they're, they're pulled apart by different tendencies. And to realize that these are different selves and possibly even different selves that exist at different levels. So the desire to stop smoking could be a part of ourself at a higher level and the, the mechanical self just wants to smoke or engage in the addictive behavior. Um, quite often, a lot of people get involved in addictions, um, things like heroin and crack and whatever, because they want to just completely lose themselves. In other words, they just want to become, you know, world 96 without any kind of an awareness. They want to just shut right down and not be in the pain and everything that they can experience. Um, so using this reference and this understanding can sort of give us insight into addiction and the addictive personality. Anand? Yeah, let me ask you uh, about Word 96. Do you think uh, when you say that we uh, to know ourselves, that maybe astrology can be uh, a way to, to do that? Um, this is a very complex question. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff talked about astrology to Fritz Peters, and it's in the back of the book, uh, My Journey with the Mystic. Um, but you know what? I'll talk about that next week. Uh, it's going to take me a lot more than just two minutes to explain that. Um, the nature of astrology from a Gurdjieffian perspective, which is also important in terms of understanding ourselves. Um, so we'll come back. We'll, we'll, we'll do that next week. Um, any other questions or anything before we, we go? Anything you want me to think about and come back with an answer for next week? Um, or we'll just take it from there. Um, okay, just try to become aware, you know, you know like I said, um, visually. The global impartial awareness of your vision, particularly the peripheral. Uh, the global impartial awareness of your hearing, especially the peripheral smell, taste. This week, try to focus on the head brain and the head brain perceptions and uh, bring those observations back uh, for next week and we can begin there. At any rate, it's almost noon. Actually, I think it's noon uh, right here. I'd like to thank you all for uh, being here. And uh, uh, Ahmed, I will do my best to try and get this up either today or tomorrow. And uh, so you can go through it and review it. Um, okay, uh, thank you for joining me and uh, we'll be in contact uh, next week. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye.